ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery depicting awesome apocalyptic events. For many, the Bible and its prophecies seem shrouded in mystery. Words like Armageddon and tribulation frighten millions, while others wonder how to avoid the mark of the beast or being left behind when the Lord returns. Can we understand the Bible? Yes. And Jesus holds your key to unlock a future without fear. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents The Prophecy Code with Doug Batchelor. Today's study, Prophecy's Final Countdown. Welcome, good evening, and welcome to Silver Spring, Maryland, where we're joining for The Prophecy Code. You've heard of the Da Vinci Code and the Bible Code. Well, welcome to the Prophecy Code. Tonight, we're beginning a journey through Bible prophecy that will inspire you, challenge you, and lead you back to the place that God wants you to be. My name is John Lomaking. I'll be your host for the entire series. Our presenter for the series is one I know very well. He's a Bible preacher, teacher, author, and most of all, friends, he's one who loves the Lord with all of his heart. Join me now as we welcome Director, Speaker of Amazing Facts, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Thank you, John. Good evening. Thank you so much. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad to see you here. And uh, we, are, we are in for, I think, a very exciting program. I want to welcome our friends who are watching around the world to the Prophecy Code event. Uh, it's very exciting to be able to be with you. And very quickly, let me just summarize, starting with this. If you were to put me on trial for my life and ask me, what is the most important thing that you could share with another human being? It would be the things that I'm going to share with you during this series. I believe that uh, we will be seeking first the kingdom of God, and the things that you're going to learn in a presentation like this are going to really change your life. Matter of fact, before I go any farther, I have a lot of things I want to share, but I wanted to ask my wife to help me do that. I'd like to invite out Mrs. Batchelor, and uh, you could help me welcome her. That's fine. And uh, her questions tonight, we sort of stack the questions tonight, are dealing with questions about the seminar. And so why don't we do this so you get right. used to how it's going to look. Please tell us about this Prophecy Code program. You know, there has never been more interest in Bible prophecy than in the last few years. And this seminar is going to highlight the prophecies of the Bible with a special focus on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, as well as a number of others. Uh, you can't really study those books without studying about Jesus, the author, and you're going to find us touching on books all the way from Genesis through Revelation. But you will definitely understand the high points of people want to know about the mark of the beast. And they want to know about the second coming and the rapture and all these things. We'll cover those things. But you're going to be exposed to Jesus in a new way. All right. What can we expect from this seminar? This seminar is going to affect every area of your life. It's going to affect your family. You know, the Bible promise is... Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1, blessed are those who read, hear, and keep. There's a blessing pronounced, and it will affect you in your family. It can affect you. You'd be surprised physically. Mm -hmm. uh, it will affect your finances. Um, it could affect your, your friends and your um, future. It'll affect every area of your life because prophecy is a good thing. Jesus gives us these things he wants us to know. Tonight, we'd like to welcome back our music director, John Loma King, who is from Thompsonville, India, Indiana. Illinois. Sorry, Illinois. And he'll be singing He Touched Me. Shackled by a heavy burden Beneath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me And now I am no longer the same He touched 
touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me. And made me whole. Yes, since I met this blessed Savior, and since He cleansed and made me whole, now I will never cease to pray. me oh he touched me and all oh, the joy that floods my soul for something happened and now I know something happened and now Thank you, John. Thank you, Arlene. And uh, we're going to be uh, blessed with a lot of beautiful music during this program. Now, I'm going to be, uh, I'm not very pretentious, I don't think. I'm going to be very honest with you. Obviously, you know that this program is being produced and there's a lot going on behind the scenes. One of our monitors isn't working that actually previews the slide, the next slide I'm going to show you. So I've got this Palm Pilot, thank the Lord, that actually has the program on here. So you're going to see me looking at this. I hope you'll forgive me. I know they don't look very spiritual. I'd, mu I'd much rather, I would much rather be holding my Bible, but I can't juggle them both. And so uh, bear with me, and we're just going to get through this with your prayers by the grace of the Lord. Amen? And so uh, we're so thankful that you are here for this series of meetings. You know, during this series... Uh, I'd like to begin by talking about some of the principles of prophecy. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about this countdown of Revelation, but first it's important that we, if we're going to talk about the prophecy code, we uh, cover the principles of prophecy. Why does God give us prophecy? And then we'll talk more specifically about some of the prophecies that tell us about the eminence of Jesus' coming. I've been to Egypt a couple of times. And um, obviously, one of the most incredible civilizations in the ancient world. Um, I've been inside the Great Pyramid, and it is still mind-boggling, the technology they must have had to make those stones fit together. But are you aware, you know, our organization is called Amazing Facts, so we always like to start with an amazing fact from history or science or nature. Are you aware that for 1,500 years from the time of Christ or about 300 years after, until uh, 1799, nobody understood what the hieroglyphics meant. They were written all over the walls of Egypt, but the, the genius and the history of this ancient empire was locked in these symbols that nobody could interpret. Eventually, Napoleon went to uh, Egypt. He brought with him about 30,000 soldiers, plus historians and linguists and scientists. And when one of his soldiers was 
um, removing a wall, they found a, a basalt piece of stone about three and a half feet tall, two feet, four inches wide, about a foot deep. And there was a text that was written on this stone in uh, three languages. It had Greek, uh, Demotic, and the hieroglyphics. And they thought, what if this is the same decree in all three languages, and if we could easily translate the first two, we could use that with the gifts of cryptography to unlock what the hieroglyphics mean. A few folks worked on it for years and got nowhere, and then finally, they named it the Rosetta Stone, you know that. Finally, there was this brilliant young Frenchman named uh, Jean um, Francis Champollion. He could speak 12 languages when he was 16. I mean, this guy was smart. And he was able to, using these other texts and, and cryptography, to unlock the Rosetta Stone, and all of a sudden, the whole history of ancient Egypt um, was available because of this wonderful experience, this tool. And uh, maybe some of you have seen the Rosetta Stone. Well, as we read through the prophecies in the Bible, with a special emphasis on Daniel and Revelation, people quickly notice that there's a lot of strange symbols and signs that are in these books. For instance, if you go to the book of Revela or Daniel, it talks about a vision of a great tree in one chapter. What does that mean? Another chapter has a vision of a great image comprised of all these different metals and materials. And then another chapter talks about these four beasts and then a goat and a ram. And a lot of the prophecies are locked in symbols. Likewise, if you go to the book of Revelation, I mean, people read Revelation and they sometimes wonder if the apostle John ate pizza and then had a bad dream because it's talking about you know, a lamb with seven eyes and dragons uh, all these angels with trumpets and vials and um, different faces, all these different symbols that are really confusing to people. And they want to know, what does this mean? Well, during this seminar, we're going to help you understand, and uh, we'd like to put the key in your hand. That's why we're using these symbols of the keys here. God wants you to have the key, not so you have to come to a pastor to unlock the prophecies. We want to put the key in your hand. Jesus wants you to know how to read the Bible and understand it. And so the purpose of this seminar is to place the keys in your hand that you can understand what the symbols in Bible prophecy are. Now, the kind of prophecies that we're talking about, uh, maybe we should begin with a definition. Uh, the word prophecy means it is a, um, an inspired uh, utterance of, of prophecy as viewed by a revelation or divine will, a prediction of the future made under divine inspiration, such as an inspired mes message or prediction uh, transmitted uh, orally or in writing. And uh, that's from the American Heritage Dictionary. A lot of what people think of prophecy today has some really strange ideas. Now, how many of you have seen these kind of magazines? Don't raise your hands if you buy them. If, if people around you know that you buy these magazines, your perceived IQ plummets instantly, about 30 points. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, I went through the supermarket and I was getting ready for the seminar and I saw this one about secret prophecies of John the Baptist are found in a cave. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, that'd be great. I'd like to take that and show that to the people. And when I went to buy it, I have to tell you, I felt sleazy. Just because... <laughs> Hey, let me promise you, friends, I don't buy these except when I'm doing a seminar like this. Last time I bought one was 1999, and I looked both ways, and I was worried that some of my church members were going to see me <laughs> buy one of these magazines. But, you know, a lot of people believe these. They buy these, and they believe these. When you say the word prophecy, it means a little something different to everybody. Some people, when they think about uh, prophecy, they think about their local psychic. How many of you have seen these institutions that they've got uh, uh, on the street corners? I wanted to get a picture of one of them for a seminar like this, and it was a palm reader, foretell your future, you know, and uh, it was a purple building, very attractive building. I stopped and I was outside trying to take pictures, and she ran out, and she said, what are you doing? And I wanted to say, well, you're the prophet, you tell me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wouldn't have been very nice. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, of course, there are those who, uh, 
You've heard of the psychic hotlines? Yeah, I guess I heard one of the psychic hotlines just went out of business. I guess they didn't see it coming, right? <laughs> But, uh, and then you've got, of course, the astrology charts. Astrology online and in the newspaper is a multi-million dollar business. And again, don't raise your hand. If you look up your, your reading for what your sign says, and I don't want to be unkind, but my mother used to write for those. And I asked her one day, Mom, do you believe that stuff? She said, are you kidding? And so I know it is sort of pathetic that people read that and think they're supposed to somehow govern their day by what they're reading where the astrologers don't even sincerely believe it. I mean, do you really think that the positioning of the stars multiple light years away are affecting your destiny from day to day? Don't answer that question <laughs> if you believe you do. But... Um, there's that. Then, of course, you know, there's some people who have become famous as psychics. Uh, there's meetings all the time about Nostradamus, and others have done programs on Edgar Cayce or Gene Dixon, these people who can prognosticate and supposedly foretell the future, or look into the crystal ball, or read your tarot cards. And you have to know my background, friends. I grew up with, and I came from people that did a lot of this. And uh, some of it's dabbling with the dark side. That's not the kind of prophecy we're going to be dealing with. We're going to be dealing with Bible prophecy. That is going to be our focus. That's my promise to you. The Bible is going to be our source book during this series of meetings. And this is the Word of God, and this is where we're going to find the answers. Can you say amen? amen. And so we want to put this information in your hands. Um, we're going to go through some questions as we begin with this series. Um, another question I want to ask is, how important is the study of Bible prophecy? Well, what does the Bible say? Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Now we're beginning to go to Scripture. Some of you may have brought your Bibles. Some of you, your locations where you're meeting, we know that you've ordered Bibles. We're hoping you can jot these down and look them up later if you don't know how to find them quickly because so many Bibles have different paging that if I gave you the page number, it would be difficult. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. How important is Bible prophecy? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. What does that mean? Whenever God does anything significant in history, He always lets the people know in advance through inspired men and women. For instance, before the world was destroyed with a flood, did God send a messenger who warned them? If you read your Bible, you know Noah warned the people. He's called a prophet. And then there was Enoch who warned the people. It says Enoch prophesied in the book of Jude. Before God does anything significant, He sends a prophet. Before the children of Israel went down to Egypt, God told Abraham, your descendants are going to go. They were warned in prophecy. Before they came out of Egypt, God sent Moses. Before Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, He sent Isaiah and Jeremiah. Before God sent His Son the first time, multiple prophets warned about that. John the Baptist came. Doesn't it make sense to you that the climax of the history of the plan of salvation in our world, that God would send messages to us so we could know what's coming? What that means is, whenever the Lord is going to do anything significant, He will send a message through His servants, the prophets. Then also we can go to our next verse, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20, believe His prophets and you will prosper. What does that say? You will prosper. God wants you to prosper. And so as you believe His prophecies, it'll be a blessing that will react for you. Now, God gives messages to prophets in a variety of ways. Sometimes He spoke in the Bible through dreams. Sometimes, many times, He spoke through angels. Sometimes God spoke to prophets face to face. Sometimes they had visions. A vision's sort of like a dream, except you're up and walking around. Uh, you're awake when it happens. And so God gives these divine messages. In the book of Revelation, it says in the first chapter, he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. It comes from the Father to Jesus to the angel to John to you and me. You've got that direct line right there in the beginning. Now, I remember when we did a seminar like this before from New York City. This has been fun. We went to New York City, John, and now we're in Washington, D.C., or at least on the outskirts. And uh, we did the last one in 1999, and they were experiencing what you would call millennial fever at that time. And um, uh, 
they actually had a chart on the wall that had a countdown to the millennium. And how many remember Y2K? You know, there were people who thought the world was going to end. That was called the mother of all false alarms. <laughs> Y2K. I know at our office at Amazing Facts, someone talked us into upgrading our phones. They scared us into thinking that they were all going to die January 1st on 2000. And we spent thousands of dollars upgrading the whole phone system. And pff, I'm ashamed to admit it. <laughs> Others went in took their money out of the bank and filled five-gallon buckets with garbanzo beans. And I mean, it really was pathetic. But after 2000, some predicted that people will lose their interest in prophecy. During that year, prophecy was everywhere, wasn't it? Matter of fact, one of these supermarket magazines took our seminar. That was an uh, international seminar. They took our handbill from the seminar and they put it on the cover of the Midnight Globe. I won't ask you if you know what magazine that is because they knew that people were interested in the millennium and in prophecy. And praise the Lord, they got the monitor working for me back there. I can set that down now. And so uh, people are still very interested. For instance, I think a survey was done uh, not too long after the year 2000. In America, 61% of people believe that Jesus will return to earth very soon. 59% believe the world will come to an end soon. 53% believe events in this century have been fulfilled in Bible prophecy. Matter of fact, interest in Bible prophecy is not waning, it's accelerating. How many of you have heard of the Left Behind series? And while it is clearly advertised that these books are fiction, a lot of people read them and they believe them to be uh, historical fiction, that there's going to be a lot of fact con uh, facts connected to it. And this series of books has broken a number of records as far as one of the best-selling series for a religious series. That really is something to consider. And that's not the only one. There have been a continual train of bestsellers that have been coming off the um, publisher's list, and they make it to the best-selling list. There was the American Prophecy. Some of you have heard about that. And then someone else wrote a book called Beyond Iraq. And... Uh, People are so interested in prophecy and what is coming. That ought to tell you something. How many of you have heard of the book, The Bible Code? We do a radio program every Sunday, a live radio program, and I've had so many questions. People say, Doug, what do you think of The Bible Code? And it's based on this premise that they took the scriptures in Hebrew and ran them through a computer, and they found uh, when you, you know, draw some lines that you could find certain words together and... And first of all, friends, I've got good news for you. You don't have to be a computer programmer to understand prophecy. Because if God's got all these messages hidden in the Bible and you need a computer to locate them, what good are they? And someone else said that you can take Moby Dick and you treat Moby Dick the same way. Drop Moby Dick into the... Talking about the book Moby Dick, not the whale. You drop the book... Moby Dick into a computer program, and you'll get the same results. You can find almost anything you look for. And so I wouldn't think that, uh, I wouldn't put a lot of credibility in that. And then there's some new books. You've heard, of course, about the, the Da Vinci Code. And they're turning that one into a movie because it's so popular. Uh, it has a very false biblical scenario, if you don't mind my saying so, but I guess I've heard it's supposed to be entertaining uh, fiction, But, you know, people in America have problems getting their facts and their fiction mixed up because we watch so much television. Matter of fact, people around the world. And this other book just came out from Tyndale Publishers, uh, The Last Disciple. I know the author. Matter of fact, the author of that book mentioned our program on his national radio program last week. And so I guess we're making the headlines, too. Um, a man who is the head of the Divinity Department in... Uh, a university, he said, I can't read his name, Bernard McGinn, I'm sorry, over the past 30 years, more scholarship has been devoted to apocalyptic prophecies, last day events, than in the last 300. Now, why am I sharing this with you? There is an accelerated interest in Bible prophecy, and I think that part of it is driven by not just people being sensational, because 2000 is gone. That would have been understandable when the millennium transitioned, but it's keeping, it's, it's accelerating. I think the Holy Spirit is telling people that God is about to do something, and He wants us to be ready for it. Question number three, can Bible prophecy be trusted? Can we trust the prophecies in the Bible? Are they accurate? Are they dependable? A few verses for you, Isaiah 47, verse 8 and 9, and uh, the prophet there tells us, I am the Lord 
New things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And again, in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. You and I can't read the future, but you know, there's something about God. You and I live in the present. God lives simultaneously in all parts of time. We can't understand that. It makes our brains start to bubble when you just try and think about it. But God can exist in the past and in the future, and He's not restricted by time. And so when he tells you something's going to happen, he's not guessing like the weatherman. He knows what's going to happen. Amen? Amen. And it doesn't fail. And prophecy, another example is when Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. He told them that the prophecies, the good things in prophecy were fulfilled. In the book of Joshua, chapter 23, verse 14, here he said, And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing, how many? Not one thing. See, Moses made many prophecies, and God gave prophecies to Abraham and Jacob and Isaac about his people. When Joshua finally brought them into the promised land and they conquered their enemies, Joshua said, not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. Good things. Some people think all the prophecies in the Bible are doom and gloom and wrath and plagues, and a lot of prophecy is good things, and you're going to find out some of the good things that God has planned for you. Not one of them has failed. He brought them all to pass. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, what did Jesus say about the dependability of prophecy? He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And we're going to look at a few of Jesus' specific prophecies a little later on. Another example of some striking prophecies, I wish we had more time, Daniel chapter 2. How many of you have read that chapter where it talks about this metallic image made out of gold and silver and bronze and iron and the feet are iron and clay and for years the skeptics said oh this prophecy is so accurate because in this prophecy Daniel tells all the kingdoms of the world from the time of Babylon to the second coming of Christ and he says in perfect order and names many of them that Babylon would be a world empire and then Medo-Persia then Greece then Rome and then Rome would divide and all of it happened and the skeptics said well that was all written after the Roman era And it was just made up and stuck in the Bible. But you know, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and they know the book of Daniel was written before the time of Christ. And they don't know how to deal with that because it is so accurate. You can count on the prophecies. And by the way, according to the prophecy of Daniel, we're right down on the very toes of that image. The very end, all of it has happened the way it's said. You know, one of the most amazing things for me that proves the dependability of prophecy is Jesus' first coming. Now, I mentioned to you that I am from a Jewish background. My mother was Jewish, very loyal about her being Jewish, even though she was not very religious. You realize you can be Jewish and not be religious. And when she heard I was thinking of being a Christian, that really upset her, upset my whole family, a Jewish family anyway. And I thought very carefully about Christianity because we always thought Christians persecute the Jews. Um, You may not know this, but some Jews have the idea that Many of the Nazis claim to be Christians. And you can go through history. There's been a lot of persecution. So for me to accept Jesus and the New Testament as valid was a real struggle. But I began to look at the Old Testament prophecies. And it was very troubling to me. Because there are over 300 Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah that are fulfilled when Jesus came. And it was fulfilled perfectly. Let me give you an example of just a few of those I have here in my Bible that uh, I've added to my notes. Prophecies that are very specific, dealing with things like, uh, talks about the time of his birth, that he'd be born of a virgin, the place of his birth, his ministry, the events of his betrayal, the manner of his execution, his resurrection and ascension, and it all happened exactly as God's Word had foretold it would happen. Notice here, Old Testament, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, said he would be born in Bethlehem. Matter of fact, the religious leaders knew that. They quoted that to King Herod. They knew that was a prophecy. It happened. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. Did it happen? That he would be of the lineage of David, King David. Did that happen? I'm just giving you 12 out of 300. That King Herod would try to murder him as a baby, Jeremiah 31, 15. Did it happen? Sold for 30 pieces of silver. How can you be that specific in advance? Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Did it happen? 
You can talk to me. This is a seminar. Did it happen? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I feel better. People watching around the world are going to think there's nobody here. <laughs> Crucified. Crucifixion wasn't even in effect when David prophesied that. Did it happen? That his clothing would be gambled for. How could you predict that? Um, Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. 18. None of his bones would be broken. Did it happen? The way the Bible prophesied? Psalm 34, 20. Buried in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53, 9. Did it happen? The year, hour of his death. I'm sorry. The year, day, and hour of his death. Daniel 9, 26 and 27. Exodus 12. The number. Did it come true? That he'd be raised the third day. Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. Did it come true? Now, I've just given you 12 of 300 Old Testament prophecies about the first coming of Jesus. See, during the seminar, we're going to talk a lot about the second coming of Jesus. I want you to know he came the first time just as he predicted. By the way, don't forget, God's people had been waiting 1,500 years for his second coming, almost 2,000 years from Abraham. They had begun to lose faith it was going to ever happen. The very same thing that is happening now, 2,000 years after his first coming. He's going to come. Right on time. That's why we're singing that song. Jesus will come on time. He's not late. Somebody uh, did a, some, a survey on this. Um, Dr. Peter Stoner, former chairman of astronomy and the engineering at the Pasadena College in California, he worked with 600 students for several years. He applied the principles of probability. He was a statistician. Um, regarding the prophecies of the Messiah's coming, just considered eight prophecies. Of those eight prophecies, of the hundreds that are available, they decided that statistically the chances of all eight of those being fulfilled in one man in a lifetime is more than one. Now, I don't know what that number is, <laughs> but there are 33 zeros. I counted them. And if someone wants to email me and tell me what that number is, I'll be happy to share it with everybody. What are the chances of somebody staging that? What are the chances of that happening by accident? There's no question that Jesus was the Messiah, and He came right on time, just as the prophecy said He would. Question number four, what can we expect from the careful study of Bible prophecy? As we gather together in this first seminar, we're going to be studying the prophecies. What can we anticipate will come from that? Answer, the Bible promises a blessing. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written in it for the time is near. Oh, by the way, friends, you notice it's not just those who hear and read, but those who keep. God not only wants us to be hearers of the word, he wants us to be doers. That's what keep means. And the greatest blessings, you'll be blessed by coming, I promise you. And I've not yet done a seminar like this where I've not experienced people coming up and saying, you know, my wife and I came, we haven't been talking, we we're on the verge of divorce. I've had couples say we've filed for divorce, but we came to the seminar together, came from different directions, we met, and something's happened through the proclamation of the word, we're together now. Uh, all kinds of miraculous things happen. You will be blessed. How do I know that? Doug, are you promising something? No, God is promising it. Don't take it up with me. I believe his word. He says there's a blessing. And you know, the amazing thing to me is that I meet people who say, oh, I didn't want to come to this seminar. I've actually had people come to our seminars. They said, our pastor told us not to come. He said, there's a curse pronounced on anybody who reads Revelation. <laughs> really? Is that what it says? Well, they just read about the plagues and the boils and stuff, and they don't realize that it's a blessing pronounced on those who read. There is a curse at the end for anyone who changes the words of the prophecy, but he's blessing those who read it. So you'll get a blessing in your life when you come. Furthermore, question number five. Why do some prophecies seem difficult to understand? Well, you can read in Luke chapter 8, verse 10, Jesus tells us. He said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables. Why? He says that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. What does the Lord mean by that? Well, many of the Bible prophecies were written while these apocalyptic prophecies with all the symbols, they were written during a time when God's people were captives in another country. 
Uh, John was a captive on the Isle of Patmos under the authority of Rome. Daniel was a captive in Babylon, Ezekiel in Persia. Not all the prophecies are apocalyptic where you've got the symbols in them that are very pronounced. And in order to protect the messages, they were given in this symbolic language. But the keys to unlock those symbols are in the Bible. I'll, I'll tell you more about that a little later. You know, I used to live on the Navajo Re Reservation in New Mexico. I was a pastor of a Navajo congregation. And I tried to learn. I'm pretty good with languages, and I, I've picked up a few words in every language. But about all I remember in Navajo is yate, which is hello. <laughs> oh, I also remember the word yes is oh. Because I used to always think they were saying no, and they were saying yes, oh. <laughs> and that meant yes. <laughs> and it was very confusing. But, you know, some of you may know that during World War II, a number of the Navajos were code operators because the Japanese broke every American code, and they were desperate. And so someone who had grown up as a missionary on the Navajo reservation suggested, you ought to use the Navajos because their language is so difficult to understand and it had barely just begun to be written for the Bible, actually. And they used these Navajo code operators and the Japanese could never figure out what in the world they were saying. And not only did they speak in Navajo on the radio, but then they used code in Navajo. I forget all the words, but like a, uh, you know, they call a blue jay would be a dive bomber and a turtle was a tank. And they, they say, oh, there's five turtles coming up the road. Or, and this, and they, then they say that in Navajo. They never could figure it out. But the Navajos had no problem because they spoke Navajo. So when you read the Bible and begin to understand the symbols, and we're going to try this tonight. I'm going to give you some Bible symbols. We're going to read a verse. You'll begin to say, ah, that's how you can understand some of these prophecies. Question number six. So how can I understand the secret code of prophecy? And that's what we're all wondering tonight. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Several things you can do if you want to understand the Bible. Jesus said what? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. Ask, seek. How many of you have discovered that when you're searching for something and you find it, you rejoice. Most of you are not very happy about finding your keys when they're where you left them. <laughs> you're happy about finding your keys after they've been lost, right? <clears throat> Tonight, we're in our haste of getting ready, Karen, on her way here, forgot something back at our apartment. And so she said, I'll drop you and I'll run back. And then I get a call from the apartment. And she said, Doug, you have the keys. And so someone else had to bring her the keys. But you, you appreciate those things. How many kids get excited about finding an egg in the refrigerator? Not too excited. But if you paint one up and hide it, and then they find it, oh, they squeal. They're so excited, right? And so the Lord knows that there's this in, in curiosity that he's built into us so that when we seek for something to find it, we go, praise the Lord. And there's been many times I've been reading God's word, and all of a sudden something clicks. And I go, oh, thank the Lord. He revealed it to me. So seek, and you'll find. Furthermore, John chapter 7, verse 17, if you want to understand, beware. Jesus says, if anyone wants to do his will, he will know concerning the doctrine. If you are willing to do his will, God will reveal the truth to you. But there needs to be a willingness. And furthermore, keep in mind, you need the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it tells us, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. Some people read the prophecies in the Bible and they toss the Bible aside. Oh, it's just gibberish. He had a bad dream. But no, it's one of the most brilliant books in the Bible. As a matter of fact, uh, the more we go through this, you're going to understand why the books of prophecy and revelation are being studied so much because it is so incredible, the knowledge that is condensed in these prophetic books. Number seven, what is the central theme of all Bible prophecy? Now, I hope nobody's disappointed. If you just came to this series and you said, Doug, tell us when the world's going to end, I'm not going to give you that, sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you when it's near. We have a study tomorrow night on Revelation's rapture, and you're going to see some amazing things, and even tonight. And you'll say, I just want to know about Armageddon, tribulation, mark of the beast, uh, antichrist. I want to know angels. We're going to cover all those things. But the central theme of all prophecy is Jesus. What is, if you turn in your Bibles, how many of you have Bibles with you tonight? Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Before you read verse 1, what's the title of the book? Anyone have it yet? What's it say? The Revelation of St. John. 
How many of you have your Bibles that says the Revelation of St. John? It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. That's the title that men gave it. What's the first verse now? The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what does the word revelation mean? A revealing. He wants us to know, and it is not a revealing of the beast. It doesn't say the revelation of Armageddon or the revelation of the plagues or the revelation of the Antichrist. The book is about Jesus. And so he is going to be the center of all the prophecies that we study. All the prophecies point back. Jesus is the axle that they all point to. And so I hope you're prepared for that. I just want to be honest with you up front and let you know that. Furthermore, John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said, Search the scriptures. These are they that testify of who? He says, they're telling you about me. So these prophecies are really telling us about Jesus. You can also read in John chapter 14, verse 29. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it does come to pass, you might believe. Now, I hope you're not disappointed, but not all Bible prophecy is given so that you can prepare in advance for the future. Sometimes Bible prophecy is best understood looking back. For instance, a lot of these prophecies we've just talked about, most Bible prophecies have all been fulfilled. There's still a lot in Revelation that's in the future. But when I look at the past prophecies that are fulfilled, what does that do to my faith in God's Word for the future? Strengthens it. Why does God want us to have faith in His Word? Is it so we can trust the prophecies? Or is prophecy really working to redeem us? The main goal of all Bible prophecy is not to help you know how to invest in the stock market or who you're supposed to marry or what kind of car to buy or who to vote for. It's not to prognosticate the future. The central theme of prophecy is to point you to Jesus. It is redemptive in its value. God wants us to know that He knows the future and He has a plan for you. But you have to cooperate with His plan. Number eight. What is the key to unlock the code of Bible prophecy? Now we're going to get right into it. All right, first part of the answer, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. The key to understanding the prophecies in the Bible is let the Bible interpret itself. You must compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, one reason I say that is just take the book of Revelation, for example. Out of the 404 verses that you find in the book of Revelation, are you aware that 276 of them can be found referred to in other places in the Bible? So what is the key to unlock Revelation? You need to look in other places in the Bible. And you know one of the tragedies? A lot of churches have thrown away three-quarters of their Bible. I've been to many churches where they supply the Bible. And by the way, before I go any farther with this seminar, I just want to reiterate something. This is for everybody, regardless of your religious background, and if you are a believer in the Bible, regardless of your denomination. I believe God has His Spirit-filled, heaven-bound, saved people in many different churches. Everybody hear that? And so we're coming together as God's children to study His book and find out what does the Bible say. that sound fair? And you may find some things I say, you might say, oh, Doug, I don't know if I agree with that. Please keep coming. You'll find a lot of stuff you do agree with. Amen? You know, sometimes I listen to radio preachers, and some of them are kooks, <laughs> right? You know that. Say amen. amen. Yeah, it's, I mean, they, you know, some of them are selling snake oil and all kinds of kooky stuff. And it's embarrassing for me because, you know, one of the most unpopular things you could tell a person is that you are a, a televangelist. I mean, it's like a dirty word. And um, I remember Karen and I, when we went on our honeymoon... We started to meet people, and we noticed when they said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm an evangelist, and we do TV. Oh, you're a televangelist. It's like they sneered. And so I said, well, dear, I'll tell you what. Let's, let's you know, I teach the Bible. It's what I do. And so if they ask, I'll just say, I'm a teacher. And so we'd meet people. And so, so what do you do? You know, ultimately, you meet people. They ask that question. I said, I'm a teacher. Oh, what do you teach? I teach the Bible. Where do you teach? Well, I travel around and teach. Oh, you're an evangelist. <laughs> and so it didn't get me very far anyway. But I listen to different preachers, and you know, there's some good preachers out there. And every now and then, you eat, you eat the melon and you spit out the seeds, right? And so if you say, oh, Doug, I don't know if I agree with that, well, keep coming. Allow me time to convince you. Write down a question. Maybe I'll have more scriptures to try and reinforce something I say that you go, well, I don't know about that. Uh, I, we want to know the truth together, right? 
So we're going to search and find. Um, and you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. The meaning of Bible prophecy is hidden throughout the Bible. You need to know the Scriptures. A lot of churches I've been to, they'll supply a Bible in their pew, and it's only the New Testament. Three quarters of the Bible is the Old Testament. And a lot of the keys that unlock prophecy are going to be in the Old Testament. When Jesus walked the earth and when Jesus prayed and when Jesus fought off the devil, did he even have a New Testament? wasn't written yet. And so, obviously, we need this book. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, when it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction and doctrine and instruction, what was Paul talking about when he said that? New Testament hadn't been assembled. So when he said all Scripture is inspired, it was principally the Old Testament then. So that's where we're going to find a lot of the keys. Number nine, what are some of the examples of prophetic symbols and their meanings? Well, we're going to move through some of these things very quickly. Um, first of all, you can look, for instance, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. It says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, speaking of Jesus, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. How many of you really believe when you get to heaven that Jesus is going to walk around with a great big old saber sticking out of his mouth? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, obviously, let's hope it's a symbol. It would be disconcerting if you had to visit with somebody and they had a sword sticking out of their mouth. <laughs> Am I right? Well, if you read in the Bible, for instance, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And then you go again to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, the sword equals what? The Word. Now, as you begin to move through some of these prophecies, you say, oh, so these symbols have a meaning. Um, Revelation talks about the Lamb several times. It talks about the Lamb that was slain. We'll talk about that another night. John chapter 1, verse 29, there... John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What is the Lamb in Revelation? Jesus. How many agree with that? The Lamb in Revelation is a symbol for Jesus. Are you getting the idea? Now, I'm going to give you some very common Bible symbols and their meanings. I'm just going to give them to you. You can look them up later. And we're going to take one verse and we're going to apply this principle. That sound fair? And uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 1. No, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Isaiah 4, verse 1. Now, while you're doing that, I want to give you the symbols. Most Bible scholars agree that in prophecy symbology, a woman represents a church. Bread represents the Word of God. How many know that? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Clothing represents righteousness or unrighteousness, depending on whether it's clean or dirty. It depends on its character. And the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man in the Bible? It's the name for Jesus. All right. Most of us agree with these symbols. Now we're going to read that one verse that you find in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. This is a prophecy speaking of the last days. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. They said, Our own bread, our own apparel. What is the bread? The Word of God. What is a woman? And the apparel represents character. Do they want His robe of righteousness or their own? Do they want His bread of life or their own interpretation? It tells us in the last days there's going to be many, many churches. Seven is a number sort of of completion that claim to be God's church. They use His name. They are, say, let us be called by your name. We're going to call ourselves Christians. But we don't want your interpretation. We don't want your righteousness. We want our own. Has that been fulfilled? You see how to use these symbols to try to unlock some of the Bible prophecies? So what is the key to unlock the Bible prophecy code? The Bible is the key. You know, I understand in the uh, Amazon jungle, there's some plants that can be dangerous. And they say that as a rule of thumb, that if you eat a toxic plant somewhere within 100 yards of that plant is another plant that is the antidote. They're right there together. I know it's true where I live in California, we got poison oak. And they say one of the cures for that is manzanita, and they almost always grow in the same vicinity. So whenever Karen gets a little dose of poison oak, she goes out and makes some manzanita bark tea, and that brings some relief. Now, we are going to give you for free, anybody would like to download it, just go to the Amazing Facts Prophecy Code website, prophecycode.com, 
And when you go to that website, you'll see a place where you can download a free list. You can read it or download it of Bible prophecy symbols. And it's some basic symbols. It's not all of them, but it's something that will get you going. And you can take a look at these, and it's one of the best ways for us to disseminate this information. Now, this gives us a little introduction to prophecy. Now, for our last few minutes, with your permission, I would like to get through as many of some of the final countdown uh, signs that God has given us in His Word that we are living in the last days. And... Um, if whatever we don't get to tonight, we're going to have more opportunity tomorrow night to talk about some of the signs of the last days. Question number 10, what are some of the prophetic signs of revelation that we are in the final countdown? In the Bible, it tells us that Jesus was talking with his disciples one day. They were visiting the temple, and he shocked them with a statement saying there would not be left one stone upon another. And they wanted to know. They thought the destruction of the Jewish temple would be the end of the world. And so they said, Lord, they came to him. And um, he said to them, there'll not be left one stone upon another. And this is Matthew 24, verse 2. And they said in verse 3, tell us when shall these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Then Jesus gives a series of signs. For instance, he says, one of the first things that Jesus said, speaking of signs of the end and the second coming, don't miss this. Christ said, beware of false Christs and false prophets. First thing he said, of all the other signs, you know what that tells me? Jesus was saying, there's going to be a lot of counterfeits out there. There'll be a lot of misinterpretations. I want to ask you, when Jesus came the first time, the majority of his people that had the Bible, did they understand who he was and were they ready? Could that happen again? So just because you've got a best-selling book talking about prophecy, does that mean it's the truth? Or could that be a sign? Matter of fact, the way I read my Bible, Jesus says, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. So don't just flow with the popular trends. Beware of false prophecies and false Christs. And we'll say more about that. Another sign Jesus gave for the last days, he said there would be an intensity of wars and rumors of wars. Do we have war in the world today? We're engaged in what's being called war right now. Are there rumors of war? Just this week, talks about problems with Syria and Iran and North Korea. And it's especially intense when you consider that uh, they're now worried about some uh, nuclear weapons that seem to have disappeared. I understand that since the collapse of the Soviet Union, that there are... Uh, one report said 200 nuclear warheads that are missing. Well, that ought to be a real concern. Amen? What if that should happen to fall into the hands of some rogue nation? Right? These missing warheads. I mean, some of these countries and these people are not afraid to strap themselves with explosives and blow themselves up. What if a group of them gets a hold of a nuclear device? And that's why we are seeing this increase of security everywhere I go in the world now because people are afraid. We also have the chemical agents and the nerve agents and biological warfare. In the last century, I know we're in a new century now, but I mean in the last hundred years, two world wars and the weapons are on a scale that they never have been again. Furthermore, it's possible that if Jesus doesn't come soon, man will self-destruct. Do we now have the capacity to destroy ourselves? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 22, Unless those days were shortened, speaking of His second coming, no flesh. That doesn't just mean people. Flesh means living organisms, any creatures. No flesh would survive. We're getting to that point where if Jesus doesn't come soon, man will self-destruct. In that same theme, there's pollution. Are you aware there's a prophecy in the Bible that talks about those that destroy the earth? Revelation chapter 11, verse 18 and it says that you should destroy those who destroy the earth. God made man put him in a garden, said dress it and keep it. We are stewards of this planet. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a hyper environmentalist, but I think we should care about the planet, amen, and take care of things. Does man now have the capacity to destroy the earth? Uh, somebody sent me this picture of a swan nesting surrounded by filth. In, in a polluted river, and I thought, how it's a picture of you know the purity that God created things with, and what we've done to it. And n not only that, but just it's happening in the water, in the air, in the food, in the soil. We are polluting the environment. 
Could man pollute the environment 100 years ago? Not like today. I mean, it doesn't matter how many orange peels you've got or coconut shells, you're not going to pollute the environment. Now we've got the, the ability to really destroy things. Another sign Jesus gave of the last days, an acceleration of natural disasters. Do we see that happening? I thought it was something when this tsunami struck. Karen and I, I never forget, you all remember where you were? We were driving across Nevada. We were listening to the news and we heard about it. And uh, they first began to announce as many as 10 or 15,000. Well, I've been on some of those beaches where it hit. I was in India on the beach in Madras. And I said, no way. I said, it's going to be a lot more than that, dear. And uh, the number, of course, we all know, continued to climb. And I don't know, I've heard everything from 160,000 to 200,000 people. And the news reporters were saying this disaster of apocalyptic proportions. This is, is this the wrath of God? News reporters, secular reporters were saying this disaster of biblical proportions. Even the unbelievers saw this as almost a, a harbinger, a, a sign of what is coming. Should get our attention. You know, there's a prophecy. In Luke chapter 21, G Jesus is talking about the signs of the end, just like in Matthew 24. He makes this additional statement, and there will be signs. In the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Have we seen that? Could this be a sign? And then you read on. Luke 21, verse, uh, verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And the expectation of those things that are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. You know, you go back a few years ago and people didn't understand that terrorism really was a war technique. Now we hear all about terrorism. What is terrorism? What does it mean? It is a war of using fear as a weapon. Men's hearts failing for fear. The sea and the waves roaring. Almost sounds like the headlines, doesn't it? I believe that we're living in the last days. Jesus also talked about the acceleration of earthquakes. He says there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. And of course, the tsunami was connected with a 9.0 earthquake on the Richter scale. Evidently, there's been an increase in earthquakes, and uh, I've got a graph here you're going to put up. I don't know how well you'll be able to read this, but this comes from the U.S. Geological um, Survey. See the acceleration from 1900 to 2000, and then if you go beyond that, in 1997, there were only three notable quakes, 1998, 10, 1999, 13, 2000, dropped down to six, 2001, seven, 2002, 12. 2003, 39. 2004, 39. 2005, year to date, and this is uh, off because I got this um, a few uh, days ago. We had six, and based on that calendar, if they continued at the same rate, we could be over 100 this year. You know, that would la lead me to believe that things are accelerating. Jesus is trying to get our attention. Killer weather. You know, I thought it was interesting, not only with the tsunami, but then there was a series. I used to live in Florida, and I remember when Hurricane Betsy came through. And it, but there was a wave of hurricanes and earthquakes in other parts of the world. I mean, sometimes our attention was distracted. And then the fires, and they actually had a number of newscasters one night. I taped it, and then I realized I couldn't show it to you because of copyright things. I wanted to show you several news stations. I'm talking about MSNBC and CNN, a number of them. They all had special reports. Is this the end of the world? What does this weather mean? Is this the wrath of God? Is it a sign? Any of you remember seeing some of those? These news reporters were wondering, what does it mean? Because it wasn't just the tsunami, just back to back. It seemed like God was trying to get our attention. They were asking that question. Another sign Jesus gave for the last days, famine. Do we have people still starving in the world today? Absolutely. And in some places, you know, it's hard to believe I've stood in South Korea and looked over the border into North Korea, and the people are starving there. At times, it's been so bad that reports have come out of North Korea that they've resorted to cannibalism because they've got this crazy despot there who is grinding down his people. Famine. Jesus said there'll be famines in different places, and this is the beginning of sorrows. Approximately, um, there are 3.5 million people in the world who are starving. Uh, many are malnourished. A hundred, I'm sorry, 10,000 people per day starve to death. A lot of that is caused by war. Some of it is caused by drought. Put that fact together with this fact 
that of the world's population of, oh, here it says 5 billion, that's a misprint, over 6 billion, 60% are malnourished, 20% are starving. Now, couple that with the fact of what's happening with the population explosion. Just this week, CNN released a report that uh, those that study the population growth in the world, they're calculating by the year 2050, there will be a 40% increase in the population. It'll be a 9.1, and much of it in some of the poorest countries of the world. You know, it took over 5,000 years to get the first billion people in the world, and then it only took about 130 years to get the second billion. I remember when there were 3 billion, and in my lifetime it's doubled. That's really something to think about. If this many people are starving, Jesus has to come. I will self-destruct. Pestilence in diverse places. Of course, we already know about the spread of AIDS, and I still don't think that people in North America understand what a problem this is, but I've been to Africa and other parts where the numbers, the percentages of people that are struggling with AIDS is terrifying. It really is a problem that has gone all across the culture. And uh, SARS, uh, there are new strains of very um, contagious diseases that are becoming resistant to antibiotics and tuberculosis and some other things are on the increase. Jesus said one of the signs of the last days would be violence. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, what does it say about the days of Noah? The men, thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually and violence filled the earth. Do we have problems with violence? You know, I, I am, of course, very concerned about the uh, uh, situation in Iraq at the time of this broadcast. Uh, we have a boy who's in the Marines, a daughter who got mustered out of the Army just recently. And, uh, but the reality is more people die in four or five American cities every day than die in Iraq from violence. Have you considered that? Gangs killing each other. A lot of it is because we're re perpetuating what we see. Speaking of the last days, for me, one of the most incredible uh, signs that we're living in the end is this prophecy in Daniel. I've given you some from Jesus, some from Revelation. Daniel chapter 12, the end of the book, last chapter. The prophet there says, the angel actually says to Daniel, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. What is the subject here? Time of the end. Many will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. Well, not only does that mean in the last days people will go to and fro through the Bible, here a little and there a little, but let's face it, people are going to and fro faster than they ever have. When you think about it, it's mind-boggling. There are people who are watching this program right now who remember when there was no such thing as a calculator watch, a digital watch, no such thing as an airplane. That's right. I've got a church member still alive. I used to be her pastor. How old is she? 106? 107. And she still has all of her wits. And, and if uh, Viola's watching, bless your heart, Viola. Can you remember? Can you imagine living through that kind of... My grandfather died 93 not too long ago, living through World War I and II and the, the incredible changes in knowledge that have transpired during that time. Mind-boggling. Can you say amen? Remember, with no radio, television didn't exist. And now we take all these things for granted. I, somebody was saying, I thought this was interesting. You know that you're living in the 21st century when you accidentally enter your password in the microwave. <laughs> you have a list of 15 phone numbers to reach your family of three. <laughs> Sometimes people call and they ask me my number, and I kind of cycle through two or three numbers before I realize well, I'm not even giving the right one. You used to just have to remember seven digits for your phone number. You email the person who works in the desk next to you. <laughs> You're laughing because you know it's true. Your reason for not staying in touch is you don't have your friend's email address. You pull into your driveway and call your spouse on the cell phone to see if they're home. <laughs> the prophecy about knowledge increasing. You notice he didn't say wisdom will increase? Because even with all this accelerated knowledge, man has still not learned how to love his fellow man, has he? And we're using our knowledge not only for good, but also for destructive power. You know, I thought it was fascinating this week. I'm a pilot, and I, I was intrigued by Steve Fawcett's recent accomplishment. 
just made history, what, yesterday, two days ago? Yesterday, yeah, this is a current meeting. <laughs> Flew around the world. One man, breaking records. Uh, my dad was in the aviation business, and uh, I remember him telling me one time he had to fly by himself from Hawaii in a DC-3, and he said it was the longest trip of his life. He was ferrying a, a ship back from Hawaii to California, and the, it just seemed like, I can't imagine flying around the world. I saw this not too long ago. Honda's come out with a new robot, a SEMO. Is that how you say that? This uh, new Honda robot. And they've got it now. Not only where it'll walk around and wave, and it, it can uh, do some very simple functions, but they're developing these robots that uh, now they've taught a SEMO to run. He can only run. I think he, he runs like this. <laughs> but <laughs> that takes, you know how much computer programming, you like the way I did that? You know how much computer programming? <laughs> Actually, you can go online and watch them run. <laughs> You know how much computer programming it takes? What well, we do so simply to develop a robot, but that's scary. I mean, all it can do is you can say, come here, Asimo, go, and he can either walk or run, but that's about all he can do at this point. I think he can grab things and carry things around, but, uh, and then, you know, the International Space Station, it says, many will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. Are we living in that day? This is the century that has seen knowledge explode exponentially more than any other generation that has lived in the history of man, I believe this is the generation that's going to see the coming of Jesus. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? And then, you know, to top it off, Jesus made another prophecy, cannot be misunderstood. Speaking of the last days, Matthew 24, verse 14, he said, And the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will will, does he say might come? Could come, may come, will come. Do you believe Jesus? Is the gospel being preached in all the world? He didn't say they'll all believe. He said for a witness, an opportunity. It's being fulfilled in your very ears right now. Or those who might be watching, it's being fulfilled in your eyes. Right now as I speak, with a half a second delay, these messages are bouncing off these geocentric satellites and ricocheting all around the planet. The message is going to the world, not only through programs like these, but through the internet. People are listening, and they're uh, on the radio, and television, and tapes, and publishing. And even the countries of the world that are trying to restrict Christianity, like China, it's exploding there because they're getting it through the internet. The lessons are going um, all over the world. Jesus is coming again, friends. We can see it happening. This global evangelization, I believe, is, is evidence that Christ's coming is imminent. And you're not here by accident. He wants you to be ready, friends. Amen. He brought you to these meetings because he has a special plan for your life. You know, if I wanted to, uh, um, I wanted to head home to Sacramento. <laughs> there have been times this week when I wanted to already. I get lost in your town. This is a, you get the most convoluted streets in the world. <laughs> and then construction to top that off. If I were to find my way up to Interstate 80, you know, Interstate 80 goes from coast to coast, and it goes right through Sacramento. If I was to try and make my way up to Interstate 80 and uh, drive to Sacramento, I'd have to get up uh, to Virginia before I run into 80. Would I see a sign as soon as I got on the interstate in Virginia that says Sacramento, 2,300 miles? Probably not. Matter of fact, I might have to get to Nevada before I see that sign. And it might even say San Francisco. But I know when you start getting into Utah... I saw a sign there, Sacramento, 300 miles or whatever it was. As you get closer, you start seeing more signs. And then as you're getting through, uh, you go through Utah, you get into Nevada, they're closer and closer together. And then pretty soon, you see a signs that say Sacramento, 20 miles, 15 miles, 10 miles, 9 miles, 8 miles. And the closer you get to your destination, the more rapid the signs. Friends, there have always been wars and earthquakes. But the confluence of all these things are coming together on this generation. Jesus is coming very soon. Amen. The only way for us to be safe is to build on the rock of His Word. Amen? Amen? The Bible is going to be our source book. No man knows the day and the hour of His coming. And if you're coming to the seminar and wanting me to tell you that, we don't know. But we can know when it's near, and God's Word is telling us that we need to get ready. Would you say Amen. I'd like to ask John to come out. He's going to sing a song for you. I have some closing thoughts for you, so please stay where you are, and we'll close this meeting with some very important things.
My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me did lead. I Physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. I'm glad that for he shed his blood, I'm glad he came to save. I need no other evidence, and I need no died and that he died for me. You know, I believe that you're here tonight because the Lord brought you. He wanted you to hear that he has a plan for your life. Let's face it. Life is terminal. The purpose of this life is to determine where we want to spend eternity. And Jesus wants you to be with him. He laid down his life that you might be saved. You know, I was very moved, as I'm sure you were, by the stories and the images of this cataclysmic disaster with a tsunami. You and I can't imagine 200,000 people suddenly being snuffed out. I mean, it just, it, it almost makes me weep just to say that. Some of the stories are, are heartwarming. Uh, people who saw the wave coming, and they knew they would probably die, but they ran back for somebody else. Or they jumped into the swirling waters to try to rescue a child or somebody else, and you really saw people lay down their lives. They cared. I remember reading one story that I thought was interesting, very pertinent for us. This man who had actually lived in Hawaii for years, he understood something about tsunamis and earthquakes because, you know, the volcano shaking the island all the time. Had a resort right near the epicenter, owned a resort. And when he felt the earthquake, first thing he did is he went to the window and he looked at the sea because he knew what could happen. And when he saw the sea going out, and then he saw the people that began to walk out and say, oh, look at this. We don't know why this happened, but we can collect shells. Others got their cameras and said, just look at that. And they're walking out into the water, taking pictures. He dropped what he was doing. He ran downstairs, ran up and down the shore. And he said, a tidal wave is coming. A tsunami is coming. Run for high ground. Run. I know what this means. Trust me. Get out of here. Screaming. And they looked at him, wondering, what's the matter with him? The word sunny day, placid water didn't look like there was any problem, which is what our problem is today. People think that we're going to get advance notice. The notice is in the Word, friends. Jesus is telling you now that He's coming again. And because of the warning of that man, not one person in his resort perished. They heard His warning. They saw the urgency. And they all said, hey, this guy is telling us that he knows something, that this is a sign. And we better listen to him. And they headed up for higher ground. And they were saved because of that. Friends, I'm pleading with you. I hope you'll not view this as just another meeting. I'm sincere when I say I don't know if I'm ever going to have this opportunity again. We are so close to the end and that when I look at what's happening in the headlines, when I, when I look at what's happening in the world, when I look at what's happening in the church, everything is pointing in the same direction that Jesus is coming soon. And He loves you desperately. And he wants you to be with him. He wants you to be saved. He's not going to be late. He's going to come on time. I'd like to ask you tonight, do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? 
Friends, those of you who are watching, I'm hoping that you're saying yes. You want to be ready when Jesus comes. I want to encourage you. Don't let the devil do anything to keep you from these meetings. Jesus wants you to come. That's why you're here tonight. And the devil doesn't want you to come. And he'll try to distract you. If you make up your mind, Lord, by your grace, I'm going to be there. God will make a way for you to be here. Do everything you can to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and you will be blessed for it. It's only 20 nights. And if what I'm saying is true, friends, nothing is more important. If what I'm saying is true, nothing is more important than seeking first his kingdom. I hope you'll bring your friends and enemies and your family. You may have some friends. Uh, hopefully, our location is full here in Silver Springs, Maryland. But uh, at your location, we hope that if there's room, bring your friends. It's not too late. We've just started. Matter of fact, if you were going to miss a meeting, should have missed this one because it just keeps getting better. The information we're going to share is so crucially important. And before we close, I'd just like to hear in... Uh, the D.C. area, and those who are watching, if you would like to say, I believe Jesus is coming and I want to be ready, let me see your hands. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can I pray for you? Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the word that you've given us and the message in your word that Jesus is coming soon. Lord, we know that you want us to be ready and we want to cooperate. I pray that during the time of this seminar that we will all do everything we can to come and to see to hear the word, and I pray that we'll be transformed by it. Lord, I pray that you will move the mountains and part the sea, whatever you need to do to make it possible for people to tune into this seminar, that we might be in touch with our friends and neighbors and bring them that their lives might be transformed as well. Pour out your spirit, Lord, and I pray you'll do something during this series where many will be in the kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I want to also close with this announcement. Remember, please, tomorrow night is our next program. When is it? tomorrow night. It's Revelation's Rapture. Very important study. Don't forget to check out the website, prophecycode.com. You can download, download that uh, key where Bible symbols in their meaning. And in addition to that, you can also, there's one on Bible numbers and what their meaning is. God bless you. God be with you. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow evening, same time. As humans, we all have addictions to sin. We're weak and unable to resist temptation. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been working to destroy our happiness and drown out the voice of God with those soul-destroying addictions. Apart from God, we are powerless to resist evil. But by God's grace and power, we can experience true freedom from sin. Today's free offer, Tips for Resisting Temptation, covers 12 practical steps to have real power in your life today. You won't want to miss this practical guide for victorious living. Order online at amazingfacts.tv. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S., and its territories. Or call 1-866-708-PROPHECY. That's 1-866-708-7767. Ask for the free offer, number 708, when you call. Or write to us at Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Don't resist the temptation to order this book. The entire Prophecy Code seminar is available on DVD, VHS, CD, and audio cassette. Please ask for the respective offer number listed on the screen that matches the format you desire. To order, call 1-866-708-PROPHECY or 1-866-708-7767. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S., or its territories. Or write to Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. The future is now. Share it with a friend.